Week one. These animated musical cartoons are roped into the Channel Flip offices weekly through a creaky old dumbwaiter in the basement. It's unclear whether the shiftless hunchback who operates it is the artist responsible for the content or simply a remote manservant to some low-rent bond villain in an antipodean jungle bunker. Either way, it's clearly the bruised fruit of severely arrested neural development, and we're confident of its suitability for outsider art exhibits. Week 2 <coughs> The hunchback's name appears to be Walbert. This information was a struggle to come by, as he has unusually saggy vocal cords and only half a working lung. We have since concluded that a singing voice as sweet and sympathetic as his couldn't possibly be responsible for the vocal tracks present in these videos. <clears throat> We're looking into the possible presence of some kind of Dr. Moreau-style hybrid of a bulldog goose boy, perhaps performing against its will. A week three. Walbert has revealed to us, through DNA evidence, that the singer, and indeed most of the dialogue voices herein, are not entirely of organic origin, and some form of salamander with more robot parts than salamander has been wired into a mainframe and poked with various violent shapes of cookie cutter so as to tease unearthly noises from its many artificial orifices. This, at the very least, is our best hypos hypothesis. <clears throat> Week 4. Forensics have examined the contents of the secret kitchen behind the boiler the vials full of various translucent earth tone liquids we found in the fridge turned out to be regular, if somewhat irregular, bodily samples. The body in the larder was also a dead end, revealing itself simply to be five sacks of beef suet duct taped together with a face drawn on the, fr on the front, wearing a shocked and accusatory expression. Week 5. Walbert came to us today with a note. On it was scribed the words, this beast of burden belongs to me. Until he is returned to his post, no more videos will be produced. And you and I both know these videos are the only salient clues you're going to get to this mystery. DNA analysis of the uh, reddish-brown ink used in the note revealed it to be of multiple anonymous organisms. As such, Walbert could not have written it, and it is presumed to be the penmanship of his employer, a figurehead about whom we know nothing at all. The perturbing puzzle in all this is how Walbert, under 24-hour medical supervision, somehow came by the note without us knowing. Needless to say, we returned Walbert to his duties, and the videos will continue. Week 6 On legal advice, we have left the mute hunchback to his routine while we quietly observe. Investigations are mounting into the source of the videos. Our attempts to decipher the sender's IP address only re revealed an unconventional 11-digit number, which for some reason when dialed on a phone, connects to a, a kind of automatic speaking clock that only makes the sound of a thin stream of liquid being expressed onto a rough carpet. The plot thickens. Week 7. This video arrived on a long play VHS tape with a sticky note on the front saying, I will kill you in the world. Our resident mental health experts have made no progress in determining the author's condition. Reportedly, three e-meters have mysteriously broken during the investigation. Week 8. For some time we've been receiving body parts in the mail. Not just mailed to the office, but to the private homes of everyone working in the investigation. Taking this to be a cryptic puzzle, we attempted to assemble the body parts we had each received. When the best we could come up with was something that looked like an inside-out pygmy manatee, we gave up and concluded that someone was simply messing with us. We are beginning to grow tired. Week 9 The mysterious deliveries have continued without explanation. Between us we have received a turtle made of sulphur, a stocking full of ninja stars, a bible with the pages torn out and replaced with tapioca, and a toilet roll holder with the phrase, Death is Necessary painted onto it in a popular brand of error correction fluid. We have not even attempted to make sense of it all. Week 10. Experts from numerous paranormal fields have alerted us to the possibility that we may have stumbled across an intergalactic race war. At first we suspected the puppeteer behind these videos may be in league with the reptilian beings, of whose skullduggery we have long been informed. But now it appears 
They are in direct opposition. It's all rather Doctor Who, except it's not for children. Week 11. We arrived today to, to the sound of a staggering variety of racial slurs being grunted from the roof of the building by a highly trained but catatonic gibbon. We are at the point at which this does not surprise us. Week 12. Instead of receiving this video via the usual dumb waiter, Walbert himself was posted to us in a large Amazon package, upon the opening of which he burst out and threw a memory stick at us. It contained only a rich text file, which read, Look behind the cistern on the third floor. There was nothing there but a birthday card, but taped inside it was a recorded audio message and a dead mouse. To cut a long story short, 17 clues later, we found this video on a DVD inside an old milk jug, and whoever did all this while somehow evading the CCTV cameras has most definitely made their point already. Week 13. We have turned our attentions to the phrase dark cheese and its origins. It may be the name of the individual we're looking for, or possibly an anagrammatic clue to his or her whereabouts. There's apparently a vi village in rural Wisconsin called Hades Creek. We've sent an intern to investigate. The most likely interpretation is it's simply a joke. We're trying to find a way of reading cheese as a sexual innuendo without allowing dark to make it sound needlessly racist. Week 14. No one is at work. Today everyone phoned in, reporting a high fever and a splitting headache and a dream in which a moose man, they said it was a moose man, held a sturdy brick of frozen cornmeal to their left ear and blew on it, chanting, you are not God anymore. In the absence of any laws against this kind of somni terrorism, we've declared it a saint's day and we're sleeping it off. Week 15. Localized showers have made road travel impossible, so we're working from home this week. By localized, we mean a fairy ring of black nimbus clouds around the channel flip office and by showers we don't mean water we think it's light soy sauce we don't have time to go into that the moose man has been spotted in various bushes but sightings are all unconfirmed week 16 we received a singing telegram from a dowdy woman with a gerbil in her hair the song, which research suggests was in an extinct dialect of Catalan, was climaxed when she took the gerbil from her matted beehive and began squeezing it as she yelled in malicious tones. It appeared to be a hostage situation. That was until she spontaneously combusted, leaving the gerbil scurrying in a small heap of debris. As we descended to inspect the rodent's condition, it looked up at us and narrowing its one good eye it squeaked, YOU'RE NEXT, and then promptly levitated into the heavens leaving a chilling rainbow of sky dust in its wake. Week 17. Between the producer of these videos, a securely encrypted network connection, a severely disabled manservant named Walbert, and the dumbwaiter connected to the basement, we suspect there may be a clue to the nature of the creator. That such an unlikely array of catalytic, catalytic agents is even in operation, suggests a system that has not ejected corruption but grown around it like a fungus. Perhaps the answer lies not in unravelling the procession, but infiltrating it. We are greasing up an intern and sending him in to befriend Walbert. Week 18. The intern, a media studies graduate from St Albans named Ian, uh, has been with Walbert for a week now. <clears throat> After the first day, his speech patterns began to be interrupted every now and again by a sudden tick in which he snaps his head upwards and slightly to the left, opens his mouth wide and clicks his hard palate against the top of his windpipe. What at first seemed like an involuntary f uh, phenomenon now appears otherwise as it has become the majority of his vocabulary. He is down to clicks, demonstrative pronouns and a smattering of transitive verbs. It was suggested uh, we abandoned the experiment when his hump started growing, but we're watching it unfold nevertheless. For one thing, humps do not traditionally grow on the side of someone's neck. And we're taking rigorous notes. Week 19. One of Ian's arms now has full-blown elephantitis, while the other is committed to periodically grasping at the air in hooking motions as though trying to seize an invisible coat hanger. 
Three suspicious tufts of ginger hair have sprouted from the very tip of his nose, <clears throat> in stark contrast to his own auburn locks, which are now matted into a single dreadlock and wriggle wriggling around on the floor of the bathroom. His refusal to see a doctor is marked by angry fits of interpretive dance. So far, this experiment is not necessarily a failure. Week 20. We are at a loss to explain how, but a baby aardvark appears to have materialised in the basement. The pinkish oranges splatter stains adorning Ian's midriff and the hands of, and forearms of Walbert distort this phenomenon into not, into not just a physical mystery but a biological one. Ian, despite now being all but mute, is able to achieve move, moments of lucid clarity when alluding to the existence of the aardvark. Apparently its name is Julie. Week 21. The aardvark, as it happens, was just a trick of the light. What at first looked like a baby aardvark was in fact the health inspector, having got lost on her way to the lavatory. What she, sa what she saw, however, what she was duty bound to report, we were on the verge of having to pay a hefty br uh, fine, but then we explained that Ian and Walbert technically do not count as vermin, but are merely an unpaid labour force. She saw this as an abusive policy when it comes to the human rights of interns, but fortunately it's not her department, nor, as it turns out, is it anyone's. Sometimes, for some people, this country is still great. Week 22. Ian is missing. He and Walbert were both, as far as we know, on heavily guarded lockdown, but by now this kind of telemorphic chicanery is par for the course. Though we briefly considered a missing persons campaign, we figured just wait for the inevitable news article in a parazoology journal. One might say this would explain Bigfoot, but this, whatever this is and whatever it does, it does not explain a ruddy thing. Week 23. A crow landed on the third floor kitchen today. After vomiting several times into the microwave in what seemed like quite deliberate and vindictive accuracy, it unstrung a message from its foot and flew away, squawking strange phonemes which our Chechnyan accounts assistant suspects might have been medieval pejoratives. The message was written in letters cut out of magazines, mainly economic reviews, specialist potato enthusiast monthly, and zoo, and it read, Where is my thing servant? I am responsible for this creature's safety, and if you have jeopardized it, you will face a fate far worse than the one you are seconds from. The comma in the message was not a cutout, but a blot of concentrated salvinorin A, which vaporized upon opening the message, subjecting everyone in the room to a frankly un undiagnosable series of stimuli from, from which they are still recovering at the foot of the building. Several windows have had to be replaced. Week 24. The search for Walbert took us as far as Croydon, before the flashbacks became unbearable. In any case, where once the differences between Walbert and your typical human seemed conspicuous and myriad, we keep seeing humans who seem similarly deformed at a distance, but up close turn out to be promotional cutouts and phone booths. We wonder how fruitful any investigations could ever be through the fog of this mindset, or indeed how we would even go about measuring those wanderings. Luckily when we returned, Walbert had already returned to his usual post. At first we thought it might have been some kind of cabinet, but he seems consistent from every magnitude of Zoom. Thankfully things are finally back to normal, though it seems unusually difficult to get a cup of tea around here. Week 25. We found a message written in beans. It said, NEVER! ALL IS PUCE! But it turned out just to be a bowl of beans. The oil spots on the kitchen wall seem to make a join the dots picture of an elderly haberdasher f showing a pamphlet to, to an eel. The light fixtures are humming mud's tiger feet in Swahili, but then we realised that they weren't. Week 26. The quest for knowledge and understanding has begun to resemble more of an absent-minded meander for fleeting reward pathways. Uh, bereft of, of any apparent avenues to explore, we're studying these videos for hidden messages. 
Unfortunately, rather like an expert polygraph saboteur, every aspect of these videos contains a hidden message, woven fractally into their very fabric. Every pixel in the top left corner of the 395th frame, for instance, contains a different recipe for carrot cake. Every 5847th wave in Duncan's voice spells out a different set of directions, all to an unremarkable bungalow in Surrey. Its, inha its inhabitants seem unconnected and are unable to give comment due to blood loss. We may have screwed the pooch there. Week 27. The, the timestamp on this video places its origins sometime shortly before the dawn of the Pleistocene era, which is odd because we've carbon dated the mini disc it came on, don't ask, and it's apparently older than the universe. And we are now seriously questioning said universe. And for the benefit of the tape, it's just shaking its head. Week 28. Taking A as 1 and Z as 26, the letters in dark cheese add up to 79. Multiply this by the number of light bulbs in the building to the power of pi r squared over, over half the amount of wood described in the woodchuck missile index, and you get a three digit number in which the middle digit is a coffee stain. Under no circumstances ask us to show our working. Week 29. If we perform the same alphanumeric trick with the, with the Hebrew alphabet, adjusting for its encryption within Greek, then the script for this video, including the background noises, gives a series of several hundred numbers which, when crunched into a 17th century Eritrean sand reckoner and then plotted into a GIF file, plays a three second video clip of a single leather driving glove being lowered into a bowl of porridge. That's all we know. Week 30. There's a message in the sky today, written in crimson smoke. It says, okay, it's an HTML, hang on. Right, we can't reveal in this forum what that links to. Uh, there is no known way of rating it for an audience of anyone under the age of Methuselah. What we can tell you is, it's, is it involves an unknown species. Quite possibly an unknown kingdom. Week 31, there appears to be a crater in the car park. It's roughly 20 meters in diameter, with all the hallmark obsidian deposits of a meteorite and or sperm whale. Curiously, there is a 1991 bottle Cavalier parked in the geometric center of the, of the crater, completely unscathed, with the handbrake off, no less. Half expecting to find a family of coyotes living inside it or something, we instead saw the poised frame of a small Mongolian woman sat quietly and motionless in the back seat. She saw us as we circumnavigated the vehicle, and her head whipped towards us in a robotic flash of adrenaline, with the blankest of expressions staring at the horizon of a distant star. She coyly whispered, Why are you in my dream? And disappeared in a puff of smoke. As you do. Week 30, 30, 30, 32. The, <coughs> the taps in every room of the building since 6 o'clock this morning have been expressing, in, instead of hot water and cold water, turpentine and gin. This has confused and disorientated a few of us, especially the intern who rides in on his bike and then uses his shower. Needless to say, as we escalate our attempts to make the best of the gin, we escalate the risk of collateral turpentine-related tragedy. This has, so to speak, rather separated the men from the boys. Week 33. The light switches appear to have been rewired. The lobby switch turned on the third floor east kitchen light. The switch there turned on the light in a broom cupboard in the basement. That took a while to find. This led us on a highly miserable journey up and down the hellscape that has become our workplace, trying to catalogue the extent of our torture. Then when someone tried to turn the microwave on and the parking gate outside started pummeling a nearby mini, we called in a saint's day and went home. A lot of us have become religious recently. Week 34, the oven is releasing sarin. 
Apparently that's already too far. Week 35, the windows have been boarded up, the walls are massive with charcoal black panelling, a mushroom waft in the air, kicking up in the dust and the smoke. The people have been trapped in here, going insane in the heat and the chaos for so long that they've been reduced to repeating the exact same five minute sequence of events all day every day, like caged animals with degenerative neural diseases. This is psychological torture, to an Orwellian degree. It is a real dungeon. Week 36. The front door has been replaced by a badly animated face. It won't let us in until we've answered three riddles, and we have nothing to appease it except a gold bar, a goblin horn, and a knapsack full of rotting food. We've started to hear the voices of bored and bewildered children in our heads. We've decided to walk away. Or at least sidestep away. Week 37. There, there's a cow in the disabled bathroom. We've pondered and wandered in our attempts to find other anomalies that would give a reference frame to the cow, but the cow appears to be it. Things have escalated rather quickly, it would seem. Upon inspection, we can't even find anything abnormal in the cow. It doesn't speak, it doesn't solve theorems. All its vital organs taste as they ordinarily would, raw. We probably shouldn't have been so hasty to... Damn, we may have just been, as psycho trolls call it, milgrimed. Week 38! Everyone's face is a carrot, but only for nine seconds. We called for an ambulance, but the phone was a carrot in the shape, material, and appearance of a phone. We tried to call for help from the window, but the window was a carrot. Just a carrot in the middle of the room. We don't even know why we ever thought it was a window. A bright idea came to us and we sprinted to the nearest vegetable crisper. This was not easy since the fridge was a carrot. But there, beneath the sprouts, was a bag of carrots. We felt sure these on inspection would turn out to be phones and fridges and people's faces for nine seconds and our only windows to the outside world. But they were just carrots! <laughs> we searched every corner of those carrots and it was just carrots! People think we're mad! Week 39, there is nine of everything. The questions one might ask is how is it even possible to achieve nine of everything don't seem to be answerable. There are simply nine of everything. The light switches, the door handles, the doors themselves, the walls. Even the number of surfaces in each room mysteriously adds up to nine. But so are the carpets. There are nine carpets on each floor, nine floors in each room. Nine rooms on each floor. And though you'd think this would put it all add up to something considerably larger than nine, apparently not. We can't count to higher than nine. At least. Whenever we count the number of things, we always get to nine at the very end, with no explanation as to what happened. False alarm. <laughs> Fell asleep listening to the White Album again. <laughs> Week. 40. We awoke today to find the entire universe is upside down. <clears throat> also, time is running backwards. After some examination, it occurred to us that since we're also in the universe, i.e. we're part of time and space, we too are upside down and running backwards in time. As such, how could we be aware that anything has changed? The universe could be constantly spinning around and flipping upside down and going backwards and forwards in time and we wouldn't know anything about it. Since this isn't covered in Special Relativity or the sequel General Relativity, we've had to invent the third instalment. City and Gill's Relativity. Week 41. Today was an entirely uneventful day right up until 4.59 p.m. when a leprechaun came in through the window hanging from a quadcopter. With a ruddy cheeked smile he lowered his pipe from his mouth and said, You've often wondered if everyone says colour the same. Or if one person's blue is another person's red. Well, I'm the leprechaun of the quality I mentioned and I can assure you you all say colour the same. With that the copter reversed through the window and floated away with the leprechaun dangling pensively from it like a hastily outsourced Mary Poppins. We thought this was a minor anomaly, given what we've been through, but upon reflection the world now seems ever so slightly less mysterious. So that's more than anything. Week 42. There are 37 Okapi in the car park. After arguing childishly for most of the morning over what the plural is for Okapi, we looked out of the window to see all the Okapi had ritually committed seppuku and burned themselves to a crisp, leaving a smouldering swathe of carbon in the car park in the shape of the letter I. Or it could be an H if you're standing to the side. 
So we've assumed it's the Okapi's way of saying hi. They are a whimsical species. Week 43, no fewer than 86 porcupines showed up in the car park. Rather than dilly-dally throughout the morning, they immediately went about their business, standing in a formation which spelled out the phrase, it was an I, before each taking a cyanide capsule and dropping dead in sequence like a furry domino run. Porcupines are not whimsical. They get right to the point. Week 44, it appears to be Russia. It demonstrably isn't Russia. Uh, it just appears to be. It also appears to be the mid-18th century. Again, the decor of the city remains modern and unchanged, but for some unfathomable reason, everything just seems like it's Russia in the mid-18th century. <laughs> we thought this would be more of the usual mischief being capriciously thrown at us, but it turns out it's a common symptom of what's known as ing fever. It also explains the eyeball blisters. We're trying to find out what an ing is, and praying it's not a verb. Week 45, when we saw a highly trained but catatonic gibbon shouting racial slurs from the roof, we assumed it was just another case of ideas running out. But, in certain lights, one can make out that this is no gibbon. It appears to be humanoid, and it occasionally breaks away from the racial slurs to shout, I am I! It has locked the hatch to the roof, and it aggressively hisses into the gap between the panels when anyone, when anyone attempts to open it. It seems to have features that are human-like, but horrifically distorted somehow. It is wearing a cape. Week 46, an unusually pale sycamore tree has been growing at a vastly increased rate on the roof since the arrival of this interloping hominid, whom we might as well presume to call I, since it continues to quite vocally insist on that and only that. I seems to have seems to take to the sycamore branches with ease, leaping between them as it sings elaborate show tunes in its own unstructured glossolalia. We're not sure what it's doing with all the pigeons it's killed. It's either eating them or it's stitching them together to make some kind of weapon. Walbert went missing shortly after I arrived and has not been seen since. Week 47. I was not there today. The sycamore stands taller than ever, but I is gone, taking with him the blue calm from the sky, leaving an ominous ether hanging beneath the nimbus. Then Walbert appeared in the street outside the office. He stood motionless in the middle of the road as if to face a duel, a duel with a phantasm. He stood there all day, peering into the distance. Someone says they might have heard him squeal at one point. That, that, that might have been a fox. Did you know foxes squeal? Week 48. First thing in the morning, Walbert was still there, glaring down the street at nothing. No attempt to stir him met with any reaction until exactly midday. Something, for some reason, had distracted everyone's attention at 11.59. Then, as the clock struck 12, he looked over to the far side of the street, and there was I, as if by magic. Walbert, for the first time in days, moved a muscle. Which is to say he moved the muscles necessary for his right eye to twitch only once and only four complete quivers in the motion, but movement nevertheless. I, since his mysterious appearance, has not moved at all. He remains standing about twenty yards apart, staring at one another and through one another. The air seems to have turned completely static and there is only silence. We didn't even have to block off the traffic. Something is preventing events from converging with this ghostly scene. Week 49, at half past four this morning, I began speaking. We got a new intern to camp out overnight to observe the scene. It's called speaking in this case rather loosely because although it was standard laryngeal vibration and in standard English pronunciation, it was in this case at roughly one thousandth the normal speed. It took just over three hours of continuous droning for I to complete the phrase, it is I. Just as we were beginning to revisit the possibility that this really is the individual responsible for the content, a shocking revelation came. I completed his sentence. It took six hours for him to say it, but we've analysed the wave data, and it was, without a doubt, the word... Ian. We completely forgot about Ian! Uh, week 50, 
Um, <coughs> very few of us are left. Evidently Ian's stint as an intern gave him some practical knowledge of the intricacies of the local architecture while his sojourn into whichever reality he's been in for the past few months has given him some rather remarkable psychokinetic abilities. <laughs> the building has been, has been rattled, squeezed, electrocuted, filled with brightly coloured fluids and blasted with dehydrated rubbing butter. Walbert is missing, presumed dead. Everyone else is just presumed missing. I retreated to the wreckage of a storage cupboard so I could document this. Unfortunately, Ian appears to have followed me here and is now opening the door. Apparently, it's our evil panda.